Welcome. My name is David Drake, and I'm not sure how many people we have here today. Looks like it's uh, just the three of us right now. Wonderful. So my name is David Drake. We're talking about the global financial and monetary systems globally. I am in New York City, and we have a couple of our colleagues here joining us for a session about financial and monetary systems. My family office, I made my fortune in New York City in real estate and tech, and since then invested in well, several hundreds of investments early stage and also venture capital and other things such as private equity capital markets and foreign direct investments as well. We get involved with that with countries. And here we go. I wanted to introduce everybody to Ebby Parsons. Hi, Ebby. Where are you at? Hi, I'm Ebby Parsons. I'm down in St. Simons Island, Georgia. Um, it's on the coast of Georgia, about an hour north of Jacksonville. Oh, nice. So tell us about your background. You know, take three, four minutes, talk about where you, where you went to school, how you got into the business, what you do today. Yes, definitely. So I'm excited to meet everyone. Um, Ebby Parsons again. I'm the founder and managing partner here at Yardstick Management. Um, and I'm proud that we are now a nine-year-old firm. Uh, we're actually the nation's leading black-owned management consulting firm. Um, and as the, the nation's leading black-owned management consulting firm, we support uh, many of the world's most recognizable companies from Netflix to Amazon to, you know, you name it. We've had the, the, the good fortune of, of partnering with the organizations. Um, my, my career progression has been quite uh, quite interesting, to say the least. I began my career as an engineer at Florida a &M University down in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, worked for several large organizations like General Motors and Medtronic as an engineer. Uh, completed my MBA at the University of Minnesota. Uh, where I got into investment management. Um, my first role was running uh, the internal investment portfolio for American Express. Um, following that, had a career transition where I learned about the nation's uh, largest school districts and, and the challenges uh, that, that exist around graduation rates and transitioned into uh, education management where I was the COO of Hartford Public Schools um, and also COO of a major um, education management organization. Completed my doctorate in education at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and following Penn, um, I actually launched Yardstick Learning, which then transitioned into Yardstick Management. So now we've been around for nine years, and uh, we support many organizations all around the world and um, are an exciting global team. Well, thank you for sharing that. And maybe tell us about the company, what Yardstick does. So Yardstick, we, we do three things. We do management consulting, diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting, and talent solutions, uh, mo most, mostly on the talent acquisition side of the house. So we support organizations in their C-suites and helping them to transform policies uh, to ensure equity and compensation, equity and opportunity, inclusive job descriptions, inclusive cultures, um, finding some of the top diverse talent in the world to, to join the ranks of their C-suites and their boards. So really, really focused on um, organizational transformation. Well, what are, can you maybe mention two, three, you know, more prestigious clients of yours? Yeah, so we, we work uh, on several, Prudential, um, Whirlpool, Panasonic, NEC, uh, LinkedIn, Shutterstock, uh, we, we were behind some, so la last year, a couple of real re-successes, the largest investment in the history of American black banks, um, when Netflix invested $100 million, uh, we were involved in um, helping to make that happen. Um, and from, from idea generation to supporting with some of the uh, introductions that facilitated the execution of that. Um, we have also helped um, Amazon and other companies really meet um, and, and, and able to bring on board some of the top diverse leaders within, within their respective organizations. So we've, we've been really fortunate to work with so many global players, DaVita Healthcare, uh, I mean, you name it, we've, we've, we've really been able to transform um, organizations across a number of industries. No, thanks for sharing that. Uh, that's very interesting, Abby. And for everybody who joined us, I'm David Drake with LG Capital, family office in New York who made my fortune in real estate and tech 25 years ago. And uh, now we're going to head over to 
my favorite place in the world, Lake Como with Bar Turtle Boom. You live in Lake Como or no, you're, you're resting at your yeah. vacation in Lake Como, Bar, is that right? Yeah, yeah I, li I live in Switzerland and, you know, it gets a bit cold in April in the mountains. So, you know, just yes. come down the mountain for a couple of hours and, and, and end up on the lake here where I'm here until the end of next week. Wonderful. Yeah, no, I used to go to Italy several times a year just to enjoy Lake Como, flying into Milano and Bergamo, uh, my favorite place in the world when it comes to views, the magnificent mountains just hovering above you when you're having, you know, a meal and then storms sweeping over you in two seconds that you didn't expect. So, yeah, it's quite romantic. I took my wife there quite a few times, love the place. Uh, maybe, Bart, you can tell us about... You know your company and where you're based, uh, the company's based, and some of the things that it does. Yeah, so I run an investment company in uh, listed in London, APQ Global, that has uh, two main lines of activities. One is uh, global services and offices in various jurisdictions: Guernsey, Malta, London, Hong Kong. And then uh, we run a financial advisory firm based in Washington, D.C., Delphos International. And Delphos International has been around for 33 years. It's raised over $20 billion for over 1,000 clients from official sources of capital, the World Bank, the IFC, European Investment Bank, and uh, those type of institutions. It's global operations with offices in Asia, Europe, and Latin America. It does financial advisory work. We are currently in the process of turning it into a proper merchant bank with our own balance sheet that we are hoping to conclude over the next um, couple of months. And, uh, you know, it's a space. I've been in emerging markets for 25 years doing all sorts of things, both in banking and on the buy side. And even, even with that experience, I was sort of quite surprised when I got involved with Elfos how enormously large the official sources of capital are that are going into emerging markets. And we see a real fantastic consolidation opportunity uh, to intermediate those flows. So quite excited to, uh, to work on that project. Well, maybe, Bart, could you also share with us, and thank you for sharing that, uh, how you got started, where you went to school, and what? Well, I'd like to know that. You know, I went, uh, I'm, 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 I'm like George, I went to the Flemish variety of his university, at the, the, the University of Leuven in Belgium, and then I want to get out of Belgium and land uh, at the peak of the crack epidemic at the late 80s in, in New York City to do my PhD at Columbia um, in, uh, in finance. Worked there, spent some time in Washington at the Federal Reserve. I was, I was actually the first no American intern at the Board of Governance of the Federal Reserve, which uh, which led me to have to go and give my fingerprints to the Secret Service, and mm -hmm. upon which they called my grandparents, who speak some Flemish dialect in Belgium, <laughs> to see what <laughs> I was really up to. But uh, spent some time there and at the IMF, and then uh, landed in London in finance, Deutsche and Morgan Stanley. At Morgan Stanley, I run their global emerging markets business um, until 2008, and then went on to to GLG Partners, actually, we, which had just listed on the New York Stock Exchange it, by reversing into a SPAC, the good old days, one of the first ones, and um, spent some time there, run their emerging markets business, and now run this investment company. So, you know, a, lo a long career in emerging markets, doing all sorts of things, from from lending three percent of GDP to two Kazakh banks to doing the largest eurobond issue in Mexico. So all sorts of things, good fun. And, and, and Bart, can you may, maybe also bring up a couple of deals or projects you worked on that were significant? As I say, look, we, we had an enormous presence in uh, Central Asia, from Azerbaijan to uh, lending to the Kazakh banks, to lending to banks in Ukraine. So that was sort of the core and the heart of what we did in this time zone. As I mentioned, in Mexico, uh, we, we, we led actually the largest Eurobond issues in Mexican peso. 
um, which was a very lucrative investment, both for Morgan Stanley and for the investors who actually ended up buying the Morgan Stanley paper denominated in Mexican peso. So we've done all these type of things, uh, lent to you know, meat producers in Brazil did non-performing loans in Mexico and in Chile. So, you know, the full gamut of stuff. Well, fascinating. No, that's great. A great introduction. I appreciate that. Thank you. And now we have our guest, George Hugo. I got that right. George, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, wonderful to have you here. Please share with us where you are and about your company and the clients you have, we'd love to hear about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm in uh, New York City. Uh, at the moment, I'm in Manhattan in my office, but I live outside of the city. And we come here. we've been coming here two days a week for the last year uh, as a team, and that has been a major improvement of how we could work. We are entirely in the advisory business, there are elements of consulting, but we do also broker-dealer, activities in the particularly private placements and mergers and acquisitions. We also have a focus on emerging market. And uh, so uh, the, the boss and I have three connections. The same alma mater, Columbia, where I teach international banking and finance at the law school, and Morgan Stanley, where I was probably just before or after you were there, uh, but I was in London. Uh, working at a time where the m a department of Morgan Stanley was one room with four people. So uh, <laughs> I've seen Michael's grow. I am uh, very focused on what is happening and uh, if particularly uh, trying to respond to the needs of clients in what is basically impactful. But it can be very diverse. It doesn't need to be an FS3 environment. Uh, it can also be logistics, it can also be finance. And uh, it's been a pretty rolling coast in the last uh, few months where we lost some clients, we gained some clients, but we survived and we're back on our holes and uh, looking forward to what is effectively uh, a very different but uh, challenging world. No, thank you for that. And George, where did you grow up and go to school? Grew up in uh, Brussels and uh, went to school in Belgium until I went and did my university at the Catholic University of Louvain. Uh, and I have a degree in law and a degree in economics. And uh, that uh, led me to go into banking. And uh, it was not my vocation. I wanted to be a judge in juvenile courts. <laughs> uh, but for some reason, I ended up in banking and finance for my life. But I've been a CFO, I've been in government, I've, I've been working for the European Union in Luxembourg, in the uh, European Investment Fund, uh, I've been with Morgan Stanley, General Electric, and uh, a few other of those, and uh, spent two terms in London and uh, have been here for 25 years when I started running the international activities of the New York Stock Exchange until it became clear that the way uh, the government was looking at foreign listings, uh, I was better off doing something else and I created my own fund. Wonderful. And, and how large is the fund today, if I may ask? It's not a fund, it's an advisory firm, and we are a dozen people. That's right. Well, wonderful. Everybody has a very variegated background, and it'll be fascinating to hear about your outlook on the financial monetary systems. And, I, you know, part of the conversation is, you know, what relief monetary support should we be suggesting that from the 1985 Plus Accord that needs to be updated? Well, of course, we don't have to go into there, but uh, I think I'll start with you, Epi. You know, you working with diversity and how to make things a little better for economic and monetary systems. What are some of the things and policies that you guys are pursuing to make that diversity occur and how? So, so we, we work across industries like uh, we even work with a number of private equity firms and VC funds as well. Um, as we think about um, equity is the way we, we're really helping organizations thinking about 
um, leveling the playing field from a, a financial and monetary perspective. So for instance, one big example could be how we do our pay equity analyses. Um, many organizations have hired companies to do um, pay analyses all the time. The challenge is when they, when they do those assessments, they look at every rung of the organization and they look around the room at everybody that is at those various rungs and they conduct kind of a median assessment. Is, is everybody at this level two paid um, equi- equitably? Is everybody at level one, everybody at level whatever? The, the, the challenge is the, the traditional way of looking at pay equity analyses is that it doesn't take into consideration representation or the lack thereof representation. Right. Um, and that's where we're, we're looking at, at flipping the whole way you look at pay equity on its head, um, as opposed to saying, here are the eight people in my C-suite and there's one woman, seven white men, um, they're equitably paid. How are you looking at how you allocate your entirety of um, people funds by demographic? So we look at race, ethnicity, and gender. And what we do is that if we have a company and say that company spends a billion dollars on their people, um, how is that billion dollars distributed? And is it equitably distributed? And what, what happens is it really highlights the impact of having a lack of representation at the top. Um, so you'll see significant representation, particularly at American companies of black Americans and Latinx Americans at the lowest rungs of their organization, where they may even be, they may even exist in, in some level of volume. Um, but, but that representation completely goes away the further up you go within the organization. And so you'll see that pay equity analysis that we pull together showing stark differences between what an executive compensation, um, well, well, actually what a white male is earning versus what a black female is earning or what a Latinx female is earning. Um, I can't hear you, David. What did you say? Oh, I, I was saying, well, what are some of the changes from this year versus previous years in the corporate mentality in this space? In, in this space, um, there, the changes have been significant. The fastest growing job title, for instance, in 2020 was chief diversity officer. Um, that the that role has taken on an entirely new meaning. Um, corporations are no longer able to um, essentially put lipstick on a pig and say that they're doing something. <laughs> now they actually have to drive transformative change. And so what we're seeing is Companies are paying much more attention to the retention of their historically disadvantaged minority employees. They're paying much more attention to what their executive runs look like. That's why our search business has picked up so significantly as well. Um, And they're also looking at diversifying boards. And so if you look around the country, you'll see or around the world, but specifically in the U.S. and the U.K., where we're over indexing on on driving change most rapidly, you'll see um, differentiated representation on board in the board director room. And we're trying to get that in the C-suite as well. And, and what are some of the policies that are pushing this to be changed? Are there some government policies and, and directions from the administration that are in your business today? Well, actually, I'm seeing the opposite. I'm seeing business pushing the needle for government. Go- government is kind of the, the government policies themselves are are pretty slow and um, are and, and, and not sometimes archaic. Um, even I'm not sure if you, you, you're familiar with um, uh, Trump's legislation towards the end of last year, where there was um, the government pulled back on allowing diversity consultants to even um, be paid by the government. So the government is not really driving the change, at least in the diversity space. It is really the people and businesses making the decisions that if we want to, if we want to remain um, a well, um, a well-versed employer, then we have to do this work. It, it's, it's a business decision, not a government decision. That's very interesting. No, I'm glad you share that. I was curious because I'm friends with a lot of uh, board of directors of universities. When we just had a conversation about compensation, I think a couple hours over the weekend. Thanks for sharing that. Bart, if you don't mind, we're going to come back to you in Lake Omo, Mr. Views, and talk about, you know, back to the topic of, you know, what's happening post COVID, that's coming out, what, what we can accomplish. I hear some background, put a mute while I speak with Bart, that'd be great. And uh, maybe, you know, and share with us what you're seeing out of some of the emerging financial risks 
that weren't there before or maybe accelerated now and that we need to keep in mind in the future, as well as what's part of your core business. We have a launch here on the topic you discussed. Um, um, on, the, on the whole, I think COVID has reinforced a couple of uh, very powerful trends that were already pretty prevalent in uh, in the global economy um one one powerful trend was obviously uh technology i mean i'm i'm sitting here in italy and i, I can assure you you feel in the out the in the out when i speak to my my two daughters who are at college in the us um how how different life here is compared to the us where i've lived for a long period of time and where i've traveled every month for the past 25 years until COVID hit. And 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 you see that tension, which was always there, uh, rising even more strongly now. So I think that's one, one, one impact of COVID. The second impact of COVID, obviously, is that uh, events like this are perfectly possible at very short notice without anybody having to travel anywhere. And I think that that in and of itself is is going to have a powerful impact as well. But I think on the whole, it's COVID is making the world economy in a way more oligopolistic. The large are becoming larger. The strong countries are becoming stronger. Wealthier people are becoming wealthier. So the diversions that we're seeing is pretty significant. And when you look at the history, the post-war history in in the West, what we know is that uh, social democratic systems in Europe and democracies more in general are actually very good at adapting, at, at, at coping with sectoral change and changes in society. They are, however, very bad at very large changes happening very quickly. And I think we're now in an episode where the large changes are actually happening very quickly, and that is going to have very meaningful repercussions for how uh, democracies operate, how political systems operate, and how economic systems operate. And, you know, it's it's relatively early to see how that's going to play out. But I would suspect that the political and economic stability that to a large extent we have witnessed from, you know, 1950 to, you know, give give or take 2008, that, you know, that, that might be in for a little bit of a, of a reset. Well, thanks for sharing that. Are there specific, uh, you know, risks currently that you want to highlight that we should keep in mind? I mean, I remember doing Davos two years ago, you know, there were letters reading, being written that there's a lot of social unrest and we've seen that kind of risk globally. Yeah, you know, look, I mean, there, there is lots of, there is lots, I mean, clearly um, moderate parties, whether it's in, uh, coalition governments in Europe, or whether it is moderate factions in 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 in, in more by uh, systems like the U.S. or the U.K. Moderate the moderate parts of these of the system clearly are significantly structure, struggling. But I will tell you, I do think the biggest risk we run right now in the world is the fact that we now have zero interest rates in the G7. Now you may want to say, what does that have to do with all of this? But um, I, I will tell you that, and, and, and George, you'll sympathize with this. You know, we have a 500-year a, a history that when nominal interest rates are zero and real interest rates are negative, capital gets misallocated. And we've seen that before, and there is nothing new there. You could argue that the period 2005 to 2008 was like that as well. But we're now seeing it on a total global scale. And and in that sense, last year there was a credit story. There was an equity market story. Things were dislocated, and, you know, that's what it is, and they bounce back. This year, I, when you look at the factors driving risky assets, uh, it's becoming very much of a rates market. And at the Federal Reserve coming back to strengthening the global financial and monetary system, I think its task for the next two, three years is not going to weaken it, forget strengthening it. You know, no, 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 not, not, not weakening it. And we're having, yeah, it's, it's quite likely we're going to have a bit of inflation coming down the pipe. Everybody says it's temporary. But I will tell you, David, when you speak to the board of directors of these universities, 
um, you know, when you have half of your portfolio in fixed income and mm-hmm. there is a temporary inflation shock of 10%, yes, it might be temporary, but the real value of half of your portfolio is still down 10%. So let's not forget that. And on the liability side, it's not going to work like that. So I'll leave it at that. But uh, I do believe that both economically and politically we're in for a bit of a shakeout. No, thanks for sharing that. And anybody here, you know, is will is will able to jump in if you want to have a chat separately and talk right away here. So it doesn't have to be one on one here. And, uh, we have uh, John Storer who joined us. We're going to come back to you in a second. We're going to head over to George Hugo and maybe have your your input on the work you're doing, what's happening in financial markets in the system that we have. You're at Columbia University, correct? We're getting you from yep. your office. Yep. Uh, I have to tell you that um, if anybody today is trying to figure out where the economy and society is going, don't look at the stock market anymore. Uh, We are living in a completely dichotomic situation where I have to be very clear. The valuations make very little sense and we are washed with liquidity and the central banks continue to do it. Uh, I don't know if just one number could fix the idea of uh, the audience is that uh, since uh, 2007 and 8, you might remember those dates, the central bank's balance sheet has increased from 5 to $50 trillion. If somebody can explain to me what that means, except that they have become stuck with long-term investments that they cannot get rid of and they have no exit strategy, there is a moment where the system will burst. And I am not uh, capable of telling you exactly what will trigger it. But uh, even what people are doing, like looking at the value of the shares, where they say, today we are at 46 times earnings on the S&P, and the good pundits tell you that we are going down to 21% for the next 12 months. Even if you haven't studied high mathematics, it means that the Standard & Poor's companies are going to see their profits double across the board. I am not trying to be a pessimist here, but I believe that uh, the way the pandemic has been treated from a debt standpoint and from a central banking standpoint will have a boomerang effect. And we still don't know what is the damage that has been done to the real economy because we are still in the phase where pretty much around the world, we still have the 16 trillion stimulus system in place to support. Now, we can't continue at that pace. We know it. And therefore, uh, my uh, approach to the situation today is to put as a first priority for everybody risk management. Uh, Don't read what the pundits are saying. Don't listen to governments and central banks. Just have a bit of common sense. Ask yourself a few questions and you will come to some sobering conclusion. So protect yourself. That really is the way I approach the market situation, David. Yeah, no, I, I see that across crypto, alternative investments, stock markets. And, you know, we have business in Asia as a family office. And, you know, Hong Kong and China's, you know, uh, valuations have been far higher than in the U.S. for quite a while. So, you know, um, now we're seeing it ha- happening in the U.S., but I don't know if we reach the levels that we've seen in Asia. Um, at a certain um, Thank you for sharing that with me. And I'm going to jump over to John joining us. Where are you at now, John? I think you're on. I'm, uh, I'm good. Um, I'm on the West Coast of the United States. I'm at a, uh, my family uh, is a ranching family. So this is where our 
main ranches, and this is where I have been here since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, tell us about your business and your background. Everybody else had a chance to do so. We'd love to know, learn more about it. You bet. Thank you. Uh, so my uh, role is CEO of Calvert Research and Management. Calvert is one of the larger um, investment fund groups or fund families um, that are at the leading edge of so-called responsible investing or ESG investing. Um, we manage about $35 billion across global equity and debt markets, um, developed and emerging. Um, I think the uh, unique aspects of the firm or the business um, relate to our proprietary research. Um, we've got one of the larger research teams in the business and have a long history, over 40 years um, as an organization. So we've built up a bit of I think, intellectual capital. Um, and then additionally, um, we are active in terms of engaging directly with companies. So our investment approach includes you know, competitive return seeking, no question about that, despite the valuations, um, despite the uncertainty, I want to track back to those two very important points that were made. Um, but, uh, you know, competitive return seeking, but also, you know, we look at environmental, social and governance facts, factors and exposures, and we seek to help management improve value for all share for all stakeholders. But we have to do it in a way that we think will work within the capital markets. So um, we're a uh, uh, unique organization because of our research, our history, um, and then our fairly active engagement around these issues. Yeah. Well, so, go ahead. Does does it resonate with you what uh, uh, George was telling us? And so, you know, I think there are a couple of points that draw, that I that I liked hearing. Um, and going back to uh, Bart, you made some comment about. Um, I think you, it was in the context of large changes happening quickly. Um, and there are a number of those happening. The pandemic experience, I think, was one large change that happened quickly. Um, the, the so-called energy transition and uh, you know, the, the number of organizations that are making a net zero pledge or commitment um, implies a massive change that I don't think people have fully comprehended. Because if we're successful at that, we have to redraw the geopolitical map. And I just really have a hard time envisioning any of the leaders of the big players in the oil business. The big players are not the companies. The big players are the countries who control the commodity and who have armies, some of whom have nuclear weapons. So you know, the concept is that uh, any of these people are going to say, oh, I get it. 90% of my revenue or 50% of my revenue is going to go away. I get it. My role is to sit quietly in the corner while this happens. Excuse me, I have to go now. I don't think that's going to be the response. Um, so if we are actually successful, this implies a restructuring uh, of the geopolitical map. Um, and I can't imagine that'll be a smooth road. If we're not successful, we will all have tried to do something great and failed. Um, so something is happening, and it's going to be very interesting to see how it actually plays out. Um, and so I think that was a really interesting discussion that I thought Bart maybe was opening up. And then I think, you know, hard to just, you know, um, you hit all the right. George just had all these great questions. Uh, he must be on some good board of directors because he has like a great board member. All the right questions, but where are the answers? Um, <laughs> I really appreciate it, uh, you know, the comments about the uh, we keep doing the same thing over again. You know, and it's interesting to me that Bernanke did his Ph.D. thesis at Princeton on the zero bound trap. In other words, what would happen to an economy if it actually got used to being on, you know, zero or negative interest rates? And that's called the zero bound trap. And despite his ability to use all the computers available, he couldn't get us out of the zero bound trap in his PhD thesis. Here we are. Um, so how is that gonna play out? Yeah, I agree with those are, those are great questions. Well, on that note, maybe we talk about, you know, some of the superpowers, how they're approaching this uh, uh, 
zero carbon uh, pledge between you know China, Russia, India, and the U.S. and Europe. So, I mean, are they actually making movements on that in some of these markets, or not at all? Oh well, I mean, lots of lots of these governments are saying things and um, Paris aligned. Um, you know, zero net zero by 2050 is sort of the mantra. Um, R- Russia, you know, and, and China, well, you know, they stand to be in very different positions. So this is, I think, a good thing for China, right? China is a net importer of, of oil. It's never really been a great part of their existence. They've never really done all that well in the oil markets. Um, and they've, uh, they'd love to see the geopolitical power of oil, I think, decline. They have some interesting alliances. They've, they've been managing this, I think, pretty well. But they're a big winner on solar. They're a big winner on, on wind. Um, so I would think that you know, China's got one response, which you know, and they also have a public response and a non-public response. But R- Russia is in a totally different situation. Right. This is like 45 percent of the Kremlin's budget is petrodollars. So um, they're not so enthusiastic about net zero by 2050. <laughs> and they're still building pipelines. But, no, but if just... I just, uh, David, if I just, just respond to this, right? I- Igor right. Sechin, the guy who runs Rosneft, um, was last week in St. Petersburg at a forum. He was telling, he said, listen, it's, it's delusional to think that we can go through a whole scale change to renewable energy given the amount of demand for energy that there is. So he says it's going to take much longer. He's obviously talking his own book, but, you know, leave that aside. And, and to the degree that investment programs in the oil and gas industry are going to be built down, it could actually have a temporary boost to the price of these these instruments on the way to extinction. But I will leave you with one anecdote. I think the country that is preparing it very well for a post-oil environment is, is Saudi Arabia by borrowing money at zero interest rates to pay dividends for Saudi Aramco. So I think they figured it out. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you mean financial engineering can solve everything? Well... It can most certainly pay dividends, and when there is no more demand for oil at the end, you know, you don't care much about the equity anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask a question to Ed Abby? David? Of course, go ahead. Abby, because of the people you are talking to, what is your perception of the indebtedness? What's my perception of what? I'm sorry? Of the indebtedness of households, particularly those who do not have access to uh, well-paid jobs? There's a theory that we, there, there's been some research on the theory called like relinquishment, the theory of relinquishment. And um, the, the challenge, the challenge in the folks that I'm talking to, there's a lack of willingness to completely relinquish um, because that's, it, it would require a significant overhaul to truly get um, historically disadvantaged minority groups um, opportunities to, to, to get to any level of true equity. Um, it would require reparations. It would require, like, the governments uh, in the U.S. have passed uh, a legislation to study what reparations would mean. Um, but reparations is a very big word, and there's a very large number followed by that. And um, my level of optimism around the government actually intervening and in, in, in granting reparations, um, I don't have a lot of optimism there. That said, there's not a significant amount of indebt- indebtedness. Uh, people don't feel indebted to um, black and brown Americans as though, especially at the corporate executive ranks, we don't we haven't seen this overwhelming um, we need to like it's our fault that the access gap has persisted because we, we always, we, we tout that there's no such thing as an ability gap, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, mm-hmm. background, etc. cetera. Um, people are phenomenal regardless of their, their backgrounds. However, they haven't, so their ability is there, but they haven't been given the access and we're, we're laser focused on closing the access gra- gap so that we can strengthen global and financial monetary systems. But, there has to be a willingness to 
relinquish some level of control. And, and that's what we're pushing on because that, that is definitely difficult. George, what do you, what, what would you like to see happen? There is something that has struck me in the last 18 months. And if we wanted to have a lifetime inequality, we got it. Uh, those who are investing in stocks and have the cash, the money, have done phenomenally well. On the employment side, the middle and high income people have got their jobs back. The low income people are 25% in the red. 25% of that population doesn't have a job anymore. So what I would like to see is something that really focuses the efforts in a concrete way uh, to think about what, does, what the employment is going to mean in this country going forward. But what concerns me at the end of the day is that the level of debt that governments and corporates have at, is extraordinarily threatening. And the people who are going to be the first victims if we have a crisis are going to be the same people who today don't have a job. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to reinvent a little bit the purpose of the economy, not in a romantic way, but in a very practical way. There are some uh, things that could be fixed. And uh, I'm going to give an example because we're talking about climate change at one stage. Everybody believes that uh, the great discovery of the pandemics have been e-commerce. Has anybody really thought about what it costs to transport your food on Uber Eats as opposed to going and buy from the shop in the net corner? Who, by the way, will need to close because of Uber Eats. I receive a small bottle of medication in a huge box shipped from Kansas City because I have to be on Optomarex and they ship everything from Kansas City. Nobody makes them accountable. And I think we need to really go back to the drawing board. What, what bothers me at the moment is what I call general declarations. But there are so many things that can be done better. And to the a comment that was made about the, uh, the answers to the question, I'm more than willing to uh, go into that, but it might be a little bit too long for today. So, uh, so I, Bruce, can I chime in on this one? You got uh, two minutes, I think. We're going to get cut off after that. Go ahead. I'll be very brief, but, but George mentioned we have to fix the economy, and I think the, the bigger challenge is we have to acknowledge the economy is actually working exactly how it was designed. The economy is not, it's not broken. It was built to further exacerbate inequities. Like that's why it exists. The way that the way capitalism exists, the way our economy exists, somebody has to be at the bottom. The challenge is the bottom should be just as diverse as the, the world looks. Right now, the bottom and the top are actually quite hom homogenous. Um, no matter what part of the world economy you look at, it's the people who are from the most underprivileged backgrounds who always ha and consistently have sat at the bottom. So I think we need to rethink the economy versus fix it because it's working. It just wasn't designed to work for people who look like me. No, thanks for sharing that. I think we're running out of time and uh, I want to thank everybody here for joining us from the world. I'd like to catch up with each one of you independently over the next uh, month. Uh, as I wrote, take, took a lot of notes, and I think there's some really interesting solutions I want to hear more about. Um, I think we have a question here. Maybe not. I'm not sure, but we're going to be running out of time. So I want to thank everybody. You can reach out to everybody here through the system, and I uh, look forward to following up with everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Uh.